at Noah and the flood. And today's text is actually that moment when Noah, his family, and the animals leave the ark. They've been on the boat for a little over a year, but now the ground is dry. There is no more flood. God has invited them to come out. And so we pick up with that moment when they leave the boat. I want to read to you from Genesis. I want to begin with chapter 8, verse 20. The Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seeds have been harvest, cold, and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And then skipping forward to Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you. And every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. And it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for the covenant that you gave to Noah, for the covenant that you give to us today through your son Jesus. Dear Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all the hearts, souls, and minds gathered in this place might be acceptable unto thee, O God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. So in our text, what we have recorded is that first thing, the very first thing that Noah does when he leaves the ark. And when he leaves the ark, he doesn't put a fist in the air and, and do, a, a, do a fist pump. He doesn't kiss the ground. He doesn't yell out, hey, we've made it. According to the text, the very first thing that Noah does is build an altar. And then he sacrifices some of the clean animals to God. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, we talked about the clean animals. They were the ones fit for human consumption. They were the best. They were the animals that were pure. And so what Noah is doing is giving back to God some of the best things that he had. He was showing God how much God was worth to him. By giving God the best. I've mentioned this before, but our English word, worship, comes from the old English word, worth. Worthship. And so basically what Noah was doing was worshiping God. So he comes off of the boat and the first thing he does is worship God by sacrificing these clean animals upon the altar. And what a great message, what a great image that is for us. What a great example for us when the doctor says it's benign. What a great example for us when, when your team wins the World Series, right? You knew I had to mention it sometime. And you know, we're talking about the rainbow today, and I almost wore my rainbow jersey, but just couldn't do it. But I did bring my bats. You know, I've talked about the bats I didn't have it out on game six, then they lost, so I pulled the bat out for game seven. I pulled my hat out, my jersey, I had everything going on for game seven. But uh, 
my, my, precious, my precious bat. So my, my good luck charm, my Astros used, game used bat is right here in the, in the front row, keeping my wife company. Um, but what a great example for us, right? When your team wins the World Series. What a great example for us when you pass your driver's test. What a great example for us when the jury says not guilty. What a great example for us when you discover the fire before it spreads. What a great example when you hit, when you hit that black ice on the road that you didn't see, yet you don't hit a tree. You don't, you don't hit another car. It's almost as if God's hand was upon you. And you were miraculously saved from an accident. What a great example for us when, when, you, when you hear that, that it's going to be a girl. Or when you hear it's going to be a boy. Or when your child first accepts Jesus Christ into his or her heart. What a great example for us when our hearts are strangely warmed and we know that without a shadow of a doubt that we are saved and that we will spend eternity with Jesus and all of the saints who have gone before. We are Christ followers. We are the descendants of Noah. And so when God sends us a blessing, whether small or great, our first instinct should be to worship. To give, to give God thanks for what God has done for us. Interesting enough, when you read the text, according to, according to the text, it seems as if this is all Noah's idea, too. I mean, it's not, it's not recorded that God commands him to do this. Nowhere does it say that, that this was the law. When you read the text stra straight out, it seemingly this is Noah's idea. Noah felt compelled to give God thanks, to worship. I'm sure for God, you know, that act meant so much more because, because it was Noah's idea, right? My wife and I, was, uh, we, we were doing some fall cleaning not too long ago, and I don't know about your house, but, you know, we've got several kids, and somehow all of those, you know, assignments and, and paperwork and essays and, and tests they, they bring home, they just kind of seem to pile up. <laughs> and so we had a pile of, of their old homework and papers, and I'm sure some of, some of that was like a year or two old. It just kind of piles up. So we were doing some fall cleaning. We were going through all those papers and homework assignments and tests and essays, and we were throwing some out. We were keeping so, some of them. You know, do you want to keep this? Do you want to keep that? And we came across an essay written by one of, one of my children. And I don't think I ever remembered reading this essay, nor do I remember this child writing this essay. But the very first line read, My hero is my dad. Talk about a heart strangely warmed. <laughs> you know, the teacher didn't tell the, the students what to write on. I didn't tell my child that, that he or she had to write this paper on me. <laughs> well, what a joy, just kind of out of the blue, finding this essay. My, my hero, my hero is my dad. And in a very similar way in our text, Noah just feels compelled to offer his thanksgiving to his God, his, his Lord, his Savior, his, his hero. In response to Noah's sacrifice, God sends to Noah the rainbow. a sign, a covenant, a promise. But never again will, will God send a, a flood to destroy all, all humankind. And you know, it's, it's thousands of years later, and, and rainbows look cool, right? <laughs> rainbows are pretty. Had someone earlier today show me a, a double rainbow in, in a picture they took. 
But really for us, I think the rainbow has lost a lot of its meaning. Again, it's, it's nice to look at, we appreciate it, but really we don't have that, that deep sense of hope like Noah had every time he saw the rainbow. Can you imagine being Noah? And the anxiety and the stress he must have felt over that year of being on the boat with the storms raging outside. I mean, can you imagine the anxiety? Can you imagine the stress of watching all of humanity die before your eyes? Of watching humanity be wiped off the face of the earth? Can you imagine the stress, the anxiety, being on a boat for a year, not sure whether or not you were going to make it? And then once you reached safety, oh my goodness, at that point you're given the pressure of starting humanity over again. The direction humanity takes is going to be up to you and your family. The pressure, the anxiety, the stress. No wonder last week in our text we found Noah drunk and passed out. That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of anxiety. Can you imagine being Noah after reaching dry land, after coming out of the ark, and then all of a sudden the first, the first time you see storms, storm clouds forming again? Hearing the, the crash of, of thunder. Seeing the, the flash of lightning. And somewhere in the recesses of your brain thinking to yourself, I wonder. I wonder if this is ever going to stop raining. I wonder if God has had enough of me. Should I, should I even begin to, to build a, a, a home? or to plant a garden, or to raise a family. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about PTSD, but, but I've got to believe that no one in his family were prime candidates. But then, God gives to Noah this covenant. He gives to Noah this sign. He says, this is my promise. Never again will I send a flood to destroy humanity. Never, never again. You know, when, when you are anxious, when you are stressed out, when you, when you are in the valley, you and I, we need to be reassured over and over again that it's going to be okay, right? Not just once, not just twice, over and over. And in our short text this morning, eight times God uses the word covenant with Noah. Eight times. Eight times he mentions covenant. The covenant that he is making with them to never destroy the earth again with a flood. Telling Noah, it, it's going to be okay. I know the storm clouds are going to come. I know there's going to be lightning and, and, and thunder. But in the midst of all of that, remember, remember the covenant. Eight times God uses that word. When we are anxious, when we are in the valleys, we need to be reassured. It's going to be okay. And God is reassuring Noah time and time again, it is going to be okay. When you see that rainbow, it is my covenant, my promise with you that the rain will stop, that the storm will end. So don't pay, don't pay attention to the storm. Keep, keep your eyes focused on the rainbow. Now for us, again, you know, the rainbow, I think, has lost a lot of meaning, even storms, right? I love a good storm. Loved it this morning, listening to the thunder. Wish I was outside seeing, seeing the lightning, if there was any lightning. I mean, I love storms. So even storms don't have the same meaning as, as they would have for, for Noah and his family. We don't sacrifice animals any, any longer to God. And so I don't believe we're under the same covenant that God made with Noah. But I do think the covenant God made with Noah was preparing us for the covenant that we have today. So today... The covenant isn't necessarily centered around the rainbow, it's centered around the cross. So that when we are in the valleys, when we are stressed out, when we are anxious, when we are disturbed, we can, we can look to the cross and see the covenant, the sign of the covenant that God has made with us, that it's going to be okay because Jesus took our sins and Jesus took our death. And we don't offer blood sacrifices any longer on the altar. Rather, it's, G it's God through Jesus who has given us the ultimate sacrifice. 
That it was Jesus who died to save us from sin, to save us from death. That's the covenant that we have today. And so I just want to encourage you when, you, when it feels as if you're at the end of your rope, when it feels as if you're in the midst of the storm and it's never going to stop, when you're in that deep, deep valley, then focus on the cross. And know that the sacrifice has been made for you. The blood has been spilt to clean and to cleanse you of your sin. So that you don't have to focus on the storms of life. You can, you can focus on your Lord, your Savior, your hero, Jesus Christ. I just want to leave you with this image. My, my wife sent this, not this exact image, but she sent me a t-shirt. And this was the, this was the visual on the t-shirt. And it's all these uh, superheroes gathered together. In the middle of them is Jesus. And the little caption above Jesus has had what Jesus is saying to all the superheroes. He says, and, that, and, and that's how I saved the world. And that's how I saved the world. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our hero. Saving us not from the flood, but from sin and from death. And that's what we focus on. That's our covenant. That is our promise. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that you have given to us. We thank you that you are our God and that your Son is our Lord, our Savior, our hero, who has saved us from sin and death. But God, I pray over these elements of bread and juice, that they might be for us an everlasting reminder of what Christ Jesus did for us, so that this morning as we come broken, as we come in need, as we come maybe in a valley or a place of, of uncomfortableness, we come focusing upon Christ and the covenant and the promise that he has given to us. Bless these elements that they may be for us an everlasting reminder of what Jesus did for us with the cross and the empty grave. We come to you confessing our sin, repenting of our sin, knowing that we need a Savior, a hero, to come into our lives. And so we spend just a few moments in silent prayer, confessing our sin, asking you to forgive us. Let us pray.